Hello, everyone. My name is Mohamed Mahmoud. I'm the director of the Middle East Institute's Climate and Water Program. Uh, and welcome to our event today on tracking water resources from space, challenges and targeted solutions for the MENA region, where we will discuss uh, the challenges and strategies associated with using satellite technology to track water resources in the Middle East and explore how satellite data can be used to improve water resource management in the region. In terms of format today, we will start with an introductory presentation on today's topic to set the stage uh, before we dive into a discussion with our panel of experts. So let's do some introduc introductions first, and I'll start by introducing our speaker, Yusuf Wehbe. Uh, so Dr. Yusuf Wehbe is a program officer for the UAE Research Program for Rain Enhancement Science. It's an international research program under the UAE National Center for Meteorology. Uh, his ongoing research addresses next generation water resources monitoring by integrating satellite and radar remote sensing, hydrometeorological modeling, as well as uh, relevant applications of AI machine learning tools. And uh, I'll just say, uh, before I continue to introduce our, our, other, our other speakers and panelists, uh, very accomplished, very uh, long, uh, uh, resume in terms of uh, biograph biographical achievement. So I'm only sharing a very uh, brief uh, introductions on, on all. Um, so in terms of our remaining uh, speakers, uh, we also have Dr. Raha Hakim Devar, who's the founder and CEO of Zion Space, uh, which uh, is an, org an organization which connects space technologies with pressing environmental challenges in order to promote a more sustainable, equitable, and inspired future on Earth. Uh, prior to her current role, she was a director of space sciences at Ball Aerospace. Uh, previously, Dr. Hakeem Devar led research on space data integration into the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and she developed a framework for a, go for a global hydrology model to assess water risk uh, during her presidential management fellowship appointment at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, we also have Dr. Enrique Bavoni, who's the Fulton Professor of Hydrosystems Engineering in the School of Sustainable Engineering in the Built Environment, uh, as well as being the Director of the Center for Hydro Hydrologic Innovations at Arizona State University. Uh, Professor Bavoni and his team were grant recipients of NASA's Earth, Sci Earth Science Division uh, to provide long-range scenarios for water management utilizing that NASA remote sensing data and products. He also previously served as Associate Director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And uh, finally, we also have with us uh, William Straka. He's a researcher with the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies at the University of Wisconsin. And he interacts with the National Weather Service, uh, emergency response stakeholders such as FEMA, uh, and several United Nations agencies regarding the utilization of satellite products for disaster monitoring and response. Uh, he's also currently working with the World Meteorological Organization uh, to expand the use of satellite products for the monitoring of flood events. So with that very fast and, and brief uh, introductions uh, for all our speakers, I'll hand it off to Yusuf uh, to begin our event today with a short presentation uh, before we dive into our panel discussion. So Yusuf, I'll hand it off to you. Well, thanks, Mohammed, very much. Um, good, e good evening, good morning from wherever you're joining us. Um, again, thank you, Mohammed, for putting this webinar and panel together. It's, I'm very pleased to give this presentation today on a very timely and critical topic on water resource monitoring across the Middle East and the challenges associated with it. Let's jump right in. Um, a quick outline of what I'll be covering in this short presentation is a background on precipitation data sources. So, and looking, just scratching the surface on the challenges and uncertainties specifically in arid environments. We'll look at the importance of soil moisture precipitation feedback mechanisms um, and some in terms of some case studies over the Middle East region. One would think that uh, surface soil moisture does not really impact uh, precipitation uh, feedbacks in this area of the world, which tends to have not, not too much background moisture uh, on the surface, but we'll see otherwise in, this, in these series of case studies. We'll also jump into some fusion uh, case studies of remote sensing products with uh, land surface parameters. So the emerging concept of reverse hydrology 
and how that's equally important for the MENA region and not only uh, wet regions across the tropics. Um, again, we'll, we'll look into these with some practical case studies uh, before opening into conclusions, recommendations. So this presentation is going to be a little bit technical, but um, I'm looking forward to discussing with the, the panel experts we have uh, more on the policy side and how, uh, how it relates to the bigger picture. I like to start off with this toy model of the water energy um, balance, and, a, and it really is a, an oversimplification of what's going on in nature. But um, I want to quickly take you to the to the right hand side, how everything is just factored into four different parameters. So the key takeaway here is that precipitation is your is really your only climatic input to this equation. So getting your precipitation right impacts the partitioning of your water budget across the, the different of the other parameters. So your evaporation or evapotranspiration, um, your storage changes and your runoff. So getting the precipitation right is really the key starting point for any water balance uh, or water resource management uh, application, rather to be on the local, regional, or, uh, or even uh, micro scales. So let's look at quickly the sources of precipitation estimates um, historically and, and where we are to date. So we've always been relying on ground-based, uh, sort of the, the best we can do in terms of ground truth data, in terms of rain gauge, rain gauge measurements. So you know, measuring a, a known volume of water over a certain period of time. You have tipping bucket rain gauges, which, which you can get a factor of time into it and see uh, you can derive intensities. We've then moved into the uh, remote sensing estimates. So lo looking at larger scales, um, increased coverage, more um, uh, access to, to you know, inaccessible uh, areas or remote areas where you don't have uh, rain gauge monitoring. So these involve active and both, both active and passive sensors. Uh, we have ground-based weather, weather radars dual pole um, as well as single pole. So looking at all different types of precipitation, rather than be snow, uh, rainfall, uh, grapple. So really looking into the to different types of precipitation as well. And not to mention the most, the, you know, the last component of this Holy Grail trilogy, remote sensing ground-based observations is the modeling. So basically parametrizing whatever happens in nature all the physical processes involved in the land atmosphere interactions and the physical into a mathematical param parameterizations. And the model reanalysis products essentially incorporate the first two data sources. So your ground-based rain gauges, your remote sensing estimates are all fed into model development through this data assimilation component here, not to dive into too much detail. So there's no one solution fits all. Uh, the key is really to leverage all three sources and figure out um, the best or the, the relative weight uh, on which component would be more important for your specific region. Um, one one uh, product I'd like to focus on, uh, of course, it's very well known in the field is the iMERGE uh, product uh, from NASA. It's, uh, of course, uh, released primarily by NASA, but it's uh, it's, a, it's also a collaboration with uh, the JAXA, Japanese uh, Space Agency, the Indian Space Agency, as well as other partners. And it basically relies on combining acquisitions from 12 different satellites into a single seamless map of continuous uh, rainfall generation. Um, and that's the best we can do in terms of global coverage uh, at the time being. So it's at 30 minute scale, so half hourly time resolution and at 10 kilometer uh, resolution global. So this is just one quick generation I, I, animation I generated uh, just for a week of, of data. You can see how seamless it is across the entire globe. And it's a very useful tool um, that's being used a lot in the field. Um, not only that, I mean, this is just the pinnacle of what we have so far. Historically, we have several other uh, precipitation data sets uh, that have been developed since the as early as the 1980s, starting off with you know pure ground-based uh, graded products from, from rain gauge networks, others relying more on remote sensing, and others also fusing in the, the model reanalysis products. And when you compare these products um, on the on the global scale, looking at the mean annual precipitation in this trend, and I like to, to pull up this, this figure from a very legacy paper back in 2004, when they compare 
uh, a series of six uh, widely used precipitation products at the time. And then they compare them, they average them across the lo longitude, and they look at them in terms of the, uh, the mean annual precipitation across the globe, uh, plotting it across latitude. You can see that they fairly agree well, peaking around the tropics at uh, mid-latitude. But it's interesting when you map these, uh, when they map these uh, estimates on the global scale. So looking at it, looking at a spatial map of things. Now, figure A is essentially showing you the annual precipitation range. So your min and max from all these data sets. And as expected, you know, high amounts up to 500 millimeters per year uh, in the tropics. And then you see the driest amounts across your MENA region here, as low as uh, 0 to 50, 50 to 100 millimeters uh, max across the MENA region. So figure A makes sense. Uh, it looks all good. The problem is when you look at the annual precipitation relative range, essentially a proxy for your variability in these data sets and the variance in it. And it's striking to see that it's a, it's, it's basically flips. So you get the highest biases in the MENA region. So focusing more on the MENA region. And so the key here is why do we see these highest discrepancies so notable across the MENA region and not, not so much other places in the world? And the biases go up to 300% between different precipitation products, as reported in the paper. They limit the color scale to 50% here, uh, but biases can go up to 300% uh, based on this data. Now, fast forward, um, we haven't made much progress, unfortunately. Looking at some recent papers, also in 2019, um, remote sensing is still not a silver bullet for this region of the world. Uh, this is basically a suitability map. So your yellow color is plotting your ground-based GPCC product. It's, uh, I won't go in too much detail, but, but yellow is the GPCC product, which is basically ground-based rain gauge data. So no satellite, no model reanalysis. GPM is the iMERGE product, which I just uh, spoke about earlier. So it's purely a satellite-based data, but, but it has, of course, uh, calibration with uh, model reanalysis and, uh, and rain gauges. The dark blue is a soil moisture base, so the reverse hydrology concept, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But the, the key takeaway here is, again, you see this noise in the suitability matrix across the MENA region. So it's still not clear what performs best for this region. So that's the key message that I, I wanted to deliver from this, uh, from this point. <clears throat> and so, you know, why is this happening? Uh, why is it the MENA region is, you know, one of the crit most critical places in the world for water resources and, you know, precipitation is the only sole, sole um, uh, source of renewable water. So why aren't we getting it right in the most critical areas in the world? Um, looking just quickly at the Global, global Historical Climatology Network, uh, which is basically a database of uh, a global database of rain gauge uh, networks across the world from 1992 on the left to 2013, you can see a persistent gap uh, across two decades approximately um, for the MENA region. So it's not to say that this is not actually reflecting what's, what's actually happening on the ground. So in the UAE, for example, alone, the National Center of Meteorology has 80 plus rain gauges in the country in addition to several other offshore gauges. However, these are not reflected in the GHCN uh, data set. So the issue is data sharing more than uh, data availability. The data is available. The problem is with data sharing. Um, <clears throat> so in light of this, of course, there's, there's other factors why these products perform well um, in the US and Europe, for example. It's essentially because they're the developers. They're the owner of these data sets. So they're calibrated to work well in these regions. And not so much, you know, it's it's also related to the data availability, but it's also priority. So what, where the research is going in, more of the research is being done in the U.S. to cover, to improve performance of these uh, these uh, products where they where the where the research is basically funded. So that's another issue. I hope we can touch base on in the panel discussion. So with that said, how do we? What's the step forward? It's basically indiv individual researchers. Uh, from the region, looking how to how to improve the accuracy of these global products at their local scale. So we've been doing a lot of research uh, here in the, in the MENA region, trying to look at ways to improve the performance of these global products for the UAE, for example, 
uh, key hotspot on the Arabian Peninsula. And what we've noticed is, you know, as the sensors themselves are not customized for light rain events, and that's well known in the, in the GPM uh, documentation, as well as the high surface albedo from de desert land cover. So you see a lot of uh, errors from that, which is similar, uh, analogous to the to the problems we have over the ice caps in the Arctic with the high albedo in those areas too. <clears throat> So again, now diving into some soil moisture precipitation feedback. So just to, to give a quick, uh, quick overview on how complex things go. So just having these components as standalone in your conceptual model, and then you have to factor in all the different feedbacks between these components um, in your models to get the, the precipitation right, your, your precipitation output correct in your model reanalysis. Um, just wanted to touch base a little bit on this before we look into the value of it for the UAE, for example. So this shows you how sensitive, uh, how, how sensitive the desert land cover we have here over the UAE and, and for most part of the Arabian Peninsula, how sensitive it is to, to incremental rainfall over a short, very short event. So this is an event back in uh, 2016, March 2016, just a two day event of extreme uh, weather. It was a mesoscale uh, storm. So you can see it, the front of, of precipitation coming in from, uh, from the west towards the east and how it's directly reflected on the soil moisture fields. And that offers an opportunity in the sense that if you miss a rainfall event during that 30 minute overpass time of the satellite, you can still acquire some spatial information on, the, on that storm, on that observed storm from looking at the soil moisture field. So that's the concept of introducing reverse hydrology. So rather than looking at how your precipitation impacts your soil moisture, looking at the soil moisture and back calculating what would what which what what amounts of precipitation would generate this uh, soil moisture uh, propagation. So again, uh, this is just a case study. Um, you can see the persistence. You know the rain the rain event stops uh, in the top uh, scale bars. And then you can see an elevated soil moisture uh, signature in the dashed line on the downstream, which you can use if you miss that uh, rain event in your satellite acquisition. So 30 minutes is the best we can do with iMERGE. And that's unfortunately not enough for, for this region because we get a lot of uh, sporadic and extremely uneven uh, rainfall distributed in both space and time. So you can have a sustained surface moisture signature up to six hours after the rainfall event, despite the high temperatures in this region um, and, and associated uh, transpiration of ev evaporation from the from the soil. You can you can still rely on it to get some uh, spatial information. So the key the key questions uh, is how can we better monitor and predict fine scale precipitation uh, across the MENA region, and will the incorporation of certain land surface parameters such as soil moisture and other land fields uh, improve um, the accuracy of local scale rainfall estimates for this region. So the, the efforts similar to, you know, we're learning from, from what's being done on the international uh, stage is to develop the, a, a, a multi-source, you know, data-driven, a ground calibrated rainfall from all three sources that I mentioned earlier. So remote sensing, radar, and land surface parameters. And, just looking historically at precipitation bias correction, there's two schools of thought, I would say. You can broadly you know, put them into do, two different schools of thought. So it's gauge-based calibration. So just correcting, doing a univariate correction with one variable. So looking at your rainfall, doing a simple linear regression and, and trying, to, trying, to, trying to do it that way. Now with, with machine learning, AI tools, we're, we can do nonlinear, uh, mapping of variables and, and get things uh, to get more more information uh, in terms of correcting the, the precipitation field. So this is where multi-source blending comes in. And the idea here is, although it's it's a mathematical um, non-linear mapping of variables to a desired outcome, the idea is uh, there's some, so it's explainable AI. So that's, that's another whole, uh, I don't want to open that box of worms right now, but it's the idea is although it's mathematically driven, um, you can preserve some process dynamics. So the physics is stored within your numerical expressions uh, in the machine learning framework. And that's what we tried to do with a recent case study over the UAE. 
Uh, we used the GPM iMERGE product, which I introduced earlier. We had some C-band weather da radar data for uh, QPEs, the, the quantitative precipitation estimates. We used soil moisture from uh, satellite, which, which again, I'll, I'll wrap up on uh, in terms of missing data. Uh, we don't have soil moisture networks. So that's another, um, another pitfall that needs to be looked at in terms of uh, prioritizing you know, observational infrastructure for this region. So we had to rely on satellite acquisitions for soil moisture as well. Then we have the 65 overland rain gauges, which are not part of the GHCN network. And we use two different methods, um, artificial uh, neural networks. So uh, feed forward, a very simple uh, uh, one layer, one hidden layer, so no deep learning use. So this is just the prototype, just to see if there's any value from doing this type of work for this region. And we compared it to geographically weighted regression, so a more uh, simple uh, tool. So the, quickly, the, the framework uh, included four different inputs, so uh, distributed in, um, in Latin long. We had uh, radar precipitation, GPM fields, uh, precipitation fields, SMAP, soil moisture, as I mentioned, and we had terrain elevation as well, because initial case studies showed that um, the performance of each product is impacted by terrain elevation. So your, your GPM iMERGE product would perform better at highlands, compared to your radar precipitation, for example, which is impacted by, by uh, mountain blockage uh, over this region with uh, the Hajar Mountains to the east. Um, this is the framework we set up, and the target is, is of course, one output layer uh, to get the gauge precipitation. So the outcome, the output of this model uh, would desirably be as close as possible to the observed uh, rainfall gauges at the local scale. As I mentioned before, uh, Better agreements were seen with the IMERT product at higher elevations, and that's because these areas witness uh, simply witness more depth of, of rainfall. So that's picked up better by the IMERT product compared to, to light rainfall to the western region of the UAE. Conversely, the radar performance uh, decreases with uh, elevation, so uh, it degrades with increased elevation. Um, and and that's so that's the key here, right? Getting getting what you can from each product for where it works best. And then the soil moisture uh, performed well when we compare it with rain gauges. For example, you can see the signal in blue um, from from your rainfall gauge, and then the signal in black is your soil moisture. So you can see an almost match to match in terms of the variability of these two time series. Again, this was a very uh, complex approach to, to get everything to the same scale, so different resolutions. The radar data was at 0.5 kilometers. The SMAP product is at 9 kilometers, so we have to bring everything to a common uh, resolution. We did some grade to, to grid point matching. I'm happy to, to dive into the details uh, offline, but I'll spare you for now. Geographically weighted regression. So that was the simpler tool we used as a, as a benchmark um, before looking into the artificial neural network approach. Um, it's essentially a, as simple as a linear regression, except you have more variables. Uh, so you have two dimensions in, in space. So your longitude, your latitude. This is your correction uh, factor here. You have the, the other four variables. So your radar precipitation, your satellite precipitation, your soil moisture, your elevation, and then your residual error, of course. So the target, the output is the corrected precipitation. And these, the coefficients in front of each variable is essentially the weight. So the, the relative weight of, of, the, of each product to get the right precipitation. The neural network is, of course, a more complicated equation. That's why it's better to sort of visualize it in this uh, in this network configuration rather than look at the math behind it. But the math is explainable, and uh, there, we have a paper on it, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on the technicalities. Uh, to sum up, uh, this is just the, the final output of that study, um, and it's the, basically a Taylor diagram. So it it factors in three different error measures. You have the standard deviation, the correlation coefficient, and your root mean square error. What it's basically telling you is the closest point to the gauge in terms of distance, a simple Euclidean distance. If you draw a straight line from your gauge point to any of these products, the shortest distance will have the best performance uh, for the model. So in both summertime, uh, and this study was done for three years um, for summer, 
as well as for winter time. That was just the gap, the limited availability of data we had, but it proved to be uh, sufficient for this, for this work uh, at least. So deep learning, you would require much more data to build this sort of, sort of framework and we're, and we'll, we're getting there hopefully in the, in the next few years. But for now, so summer and winter, uh, you can see the ANN and red dot, the red dot is the closest to the gauge in both cases. And that was an important, uh, and to look sort of deeper into why or which variable impacted this correction framework the most, it was the soil moisture from SMAP. So looking at, so this, uh, this simple bar dry diagram here shows you the variation in the root mean square error when you exclude each one of these variables alone. So we would build the model every time excluding one of these variables. Of course, you'd expect when you exclude the main the main parameter, which is your GPM iMERGE, you'd get the biggest change in RMSE. So excluding precipitation would, would cause the biggest error in your model. The second one was SMAP, interestingly. So when we removed the soil moisture, but we kept GPM, radar, and elevation, we got the highest uh, error difference, particularly in the case of the ANN, which tells us that the artificial neural network framework is actually using the most information from soil moisture to get these uh, these uh, outputs corrected. To sum up, uh, of course, the, the scarcity of renewable uh, precipitation, or renewable water resources is a, is a key, is a key uh, component uh, in this research. So they, it, we still require accurate monitoring of available rainfall to determine water budget deficits and implement effective water resource management and augmentation tools. So the key is to to under, you need to understand what's happening in, in your present to be able to, to do preventative measures measures in the future. The other uh, the other issue I want to touch on before we uh, have the panel discussion is a soil moisture data assimilation, and it's it, you can see that immediately off the bat that it's a very similar data gap here in the MENA region as we saw in the GHCN network network. So more investment needs to be made in observational uh, capabilities for this region in terms of soil moisture. Um, it's a very, very important component that's being assimilated into many uh, satellite missions and uh, model reanalysis products. Of course, the, the, the tool we developed, the prototype tool, is applicable to other uh, regions in the MENA region. In the meantime, while we while we work on, uh, you know, more more international collaboration to to, to improve precipitation monitoring for this region, um, and and you can look at deep learning as I mentioned, incorporate other variables uh, which might be important to your correction framework. Uh, just a spoiler alert: uh, I know Mohammed uh, shared this uh, the article uh, that that sort of was the motivation for this panel. Earlier today on LinkedIn, we published the article, so it's a it's a, it's a summary with with some more uh, I would say broader implications of this type of research uh, for the area here, and of course this is drawn from a more detailed and technical uh, book chapter we have on the topic, um, and I look forward to the to the broader discussion with the, the expert panelists uh, we have with us today. Thank you, Mohammed. Fantastic. Thanks, Yusuf. I uh, surprised me there, snuck that one in at the end, but uh, but uh, I think that's a good segue. Um, you know, just before we transition to our discussion, you know, I really I want to highlight certainly for our audience that, yes, you know, we may have blinded you with science, but to really get a good sense of the need, the issue um, and the challenge. Uh, and how to resolve the challenge, uh, we, you know, you really need to understand sort of the technical uh, viewpoint aspect of the issue, which I think Yusuf laid out for us. So, uh, so bear with us after that as we use that information to transition into some technical, but also more a uh, policy discussion on on tackling this issue. Um, so before, uh, just another sort of housekeeping note before we start our panel proper, uh, for our audience, if you'd like to submit your own questions, uh, please feel free, feel free to do so via the Q&A chat or Q&A function in Zoom, uh, and I will try to incorporate those as we move along where, where it fits best. So let me start off with this question, and, you know, in our, in our, and the presentation Yusuf gave, 
We focused primarily on precipitation as sort of our primary input of, of, uh, uh, of renewable supply uh, into the region. We touched a little bit on soil moisture as sort of the retention of that. To me, it seems like the next logical piece to maybe talk about following that train of thought is related to groundwater, uh, especially for a region like uh, the Middle East, North Africa that has limited surface water resources. So groundwater becomes, or at least groundwater supplies, become a very important uh, factor to consider and to keep track of. So my question is, besides uh, the monitoring of precipitation and certainly uh, tracking of soil moisture conditions, how do you think satellite satellite based data remote sensing data can how reliable can it be for groundwater monitoring for the purpose of the MENA region as it as that is you know the main, the main freshwater supply for for most of the countries uh, certainly the you know the, the most that don't have access to a surface water supply system so maybe Yusuf I'll pose it to you and then others can chime in if if you want to uh, want to add to that. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, aside from precipitation monitoring, um, there are several remote sensing data sets uh, available to monitor, for example, land surface conditions like Landsat, provide information on on soil moisture, as we saw, vegetation health. All these are proxies or indicators for groundwater availability and recharge rates. So, not a direct measurement of of groundwater per se, but proxies that can be used in the water balance equation to, to sort of estimate your groundwater uh, variability. However, um, more direct measurements of terrestrial water uh, storage have been actually made possible recently with uh, the gravity recovery and climate experiment. So another NASA mission. And here we, you know, it's, it's a key, the key word is international collaboration. So it's a mission between NASA and the German Aerospace Center. So the DLR launched in, I believe, 2002. Um, which basically involves twin satellites uh, tracking in tandem and the, the minute changes in the distances as they orbit the Earth is sort of an indicator for the changes in the Earth's gravitational pull, which is um, an indirect, again, um, uh, information to extract the amount of water storage in your aquifers. However, um, a lot of challenges in that too for, for the MENA region in terms of validation. So a lot of validation work has been done on the GRACE products uh, for the US, uh, Europe, um, but it remains a challenge for this region because of the, the scarcity of groundwater, in situ groundwater wells to compare the signal you get from the, from the satellite uh, estimates and to compare them to your time series from your in situ well observation. So we're there, but not quite there. If I can chime in, this was a great presentation and a great panel that's been assembled. Thank you very much. On this topic of grace, it is true. The validation that's happened over the MENA region is sparse, but let's do a quick review of what has been found. And you go back to the literature last 10 years or so, there's a few key papers in high impact journals. And the amount of groundwater loss terrestrial water storage loss over 10, 15 year period in North Africa and the Middle East is humongous. It's humongous. It's on the scale of the average flow of the Colorado River Basin. We're talking 10 to 25 cubic kilometers of lost groundwater, lost where? To the atmosphere, going back to your land atmosphere interactions. Through what? Through agricultural water consumption, primarily, in, in the MENA region. And so if this is happening, it has to be verified, it has to be tracked, and it has to be linked to the water use, whether it's municipal or agricultural, that's happening. There's a big bullseye in Iran, if you look at the spatial map of where the reductions are largest but it's also in Northern Saudi Arabia, it's also in Eastern Tur Turkey, and it's also in, in Iraq. And uh, those folks that live in these countries could certainly help the international remote sensing community to verify if this is the case and to try to put in place some measures to reduce it, reverse it, the, this is groundwater mining that is non-renewable, old, 
aged groundwater. So I think the satellite uh, community, Jay Famiglieri and his team from JPL and other locations are, have done us a service to identify this particular issue from space. And now countries need to put in the monitoring equipment, precipitation, soil moisture, groundwater wells to try to address this sustainability problem. And Thanks. I might add a couple of things to that. So absolutely, you know, agree with the opportunity space to, to actually validate, I think that observational piece. So maybe just high, like underlining a couple of things, um, just in case we have people in the audience that are not all experts in these areas. Um, so, you know, important things when you're considering satellite observations, one is um, spatial resolution. So that that's essentially how much detail you can kind of see um, over a particular, you know, like observation piece, or let's say a, a, um, a scene or a pixel in some cases. Um, and then and then the other is temporal resolution. That means how frequently we're getting these observations. Uh, like Yusuf alluded to um, some of the precipitation data products being like on the order of every hour we're getting an update, which is really amazing. Um, so just on the, the piece of observations from uh, from space, from, from GRACE in particular, and GRACE follow-on, those are quite coarse. Um, so the spatial resolution meaning is quite coarse. Um, but, you know, I want to tie that to something else important that Yusuf mentioned throughout his presentation, which is that um, kind of uh, the merging um, of various different data sets together. And that is really the key to getting us the information that we need. And that could be, you know, the merging of what we have on the ground with what we have um, from space and even from airborne sensors, uh, whatever we kind of like have available to us, that is going to be really key to getting us um, kind of the, the information. So there's no one thing that will really be the um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the key to, to all of our answers, um, or all of the questions that we have. And, um, and then that, that ground-based observation is really important, but it is quite time and resource intensive. That's the reason why we're missing a lot of those observations, because it, it really does require um, kind of a coordination at the government level for you to have a sustained observation program that's, um, you know, ground-based and and uh, persists over multiple decades. Um, so yeah, totally agree. And then just on Grace, one other point is that um, these studies that have been really uh, key to us understanding groundwater depletion uh, trends in the Middle East and North Africa, um, really profound. I mean, I think Grace has been a great um, contributor to that. But again, from an operational perspective, uh, that's it, it needs to be used in tandem with other things. I think that that's that's the point that's being made here. There's um, the kind of us exploring the the scientific. Um, you know, uh, from a science-based perspective, understanding trends and understanding, you know, where uh, big challenges are, but then from operations where you want to manage your water resources on a day-to-day, -day, um, you're going to need to have a number of different tools that you're utilizing in tandem to get you the answers that you need. And if I might follow on, you know, it's uh, as you have men mentioned, you know, a lot of these soil moisture products are utilized as proxies, uh, but that's partially because, um, you know, th they really don't measure down that far into the soil. You know, you're talking maybe five centimeters, maybe 10 centimeters down into the soil. Um, and that, that's really another limit. That's another limitation. In addition to the uh, spatial resolution, you're also getting that you have the depth uh depth resolution so you're not really getting that accurate of a picture you know uh down to the root zone or uh, root zone or down even into the water table um so you know there there, there are um there are some products that provide a modeled information you know snap is one of those it's level four product you know does but it's not an actual measurement it's a model it's, it's a modeled uh, it's a modeled estimate of what's going down in there. So, you know, how, utilizing, yeah, that the proxy data, but also in tandem with the ground-based data, um, 
you know, and it, it also goes with precipitation, you know, radar is, of course, probably the most effective, highest, highest temporal, highest spatial resolution, but it does require an investment in that, uh, in that capability, maintain, maintaining it, uh, and things like that. So, you know, satellites provide that global perspective, but at the cost of temporal and spatial resolutions. Great. Excellent. I mean, uh, <laughs> it was a simple question, but you guys hit it on all angles, and I really appreciate uh, the nuance that you guys brought to it. So if that is sort of the next step in terms of, uh, you know, precipitation, soil moisture, looking at groundwater, I want to transition maybe a step higher and to me, is, is sort of the largest elephant in the room in terms of what I saw in the presentation, which is the huge data gaps uh, that are affecting uh, the region. Um, and specifically, how it looks in contrast to the rest of the world. I mean, you saw a couple of those uh, visuals that um, Yusuf provided, and it's, it's just glaring uh, how sort of those data networks or uh, information sources that would be helpful are missing uh, from the region. So with that in mind, um, to the panel, I guess my question is, what are ways in terms of strategies or solutions do you recommend? And we touched, a couple of you started to touch on that in your, in your previous responses, but what are, what are some strategies and solutions that you could recommend that can help move the region uh, towards overcoming uh, the challenges uh, of monitoring by addressing this this huge gap. Enrique, if I could start. Um, you know, we could talk about ground sensors for a while, but let me start from a different location. There is going to be limitations and resources for many countries to implement national observation networks. At the same time, there are new space technologies that might obviate the need for the types of networks that many countries have deployed. And this sounds kind of out there, but we have, we are living in a time in which the private sector is launching satellites in space and they're doing it at a massive scale that hasn't been seen before, that is not controlled by individual countries and their space agencies, and that are providing unprecedented views of the earth. And if I were a country that hasn't developed a national network, I'd try to take advantage as much as possible of this boom in private sector space companies and their imaging of the earth, to help me design the network that I want to install. And so let me give you an example. There is a private company called Planet. They have a constellation of small satellites called CubeSats. This changes the math on satellite remote sensing because we're no longer talking about having to trade off spatial resolution with temporal resolution. What am I trying to say? These constellations orbit the Earth every day and produce global maps at three to five meter resolution. Everyday maps globally at three to five meter resolution. So that, that means that you have high space and high time. Some of the innovators in this space are in the MENA region. There's a group out of cost in Saudi Arabia, Matthew McCabe, that they've been using CubeSats to quantify, for instance, agricultural water use crop cycles, evaporative, actual evaporative use of, the, of water by those crop cycles, changes in cropping patterns, whether it's fallowing or expansion or retirement. And that gets to a point, of course, they have some ground observations to, to verify their space-borne methods. It gets to a point where you might not need an extensive network if you have a good high resolution in space and time method. In the southwestern US where I live, we've used CubeSats to detect changes in surface water, in stock ponds, in ephemeral lakes, in rivers, after flooding events. So 
we could see now surface water on the surface because we have satellites that work every day at high resolution. So I throw this out there to the panel, maybe as, as a provocation. Can we use satellite remote sensing to help us design smarter ground networks? That's uh, you're giving me both an answer and a question, Enrique. You're uh, <laughs> helping me do my job. Um, yeah, I'm, anyone? I'm good. I'm going to I'm going to try to answer that call. Um, OK, absolutely. Because I, I think I think that is a smart thing to do because we're at a time period now where we have all these assets and I, they truly are assets. So we can be much more strategic about how we do our ground observations, because the reality is no matter if you're a wealthy country or, or if you're maybe you know have less resources to put towards things like this, you're always going to have to um, balance your budgets, right? You're going to have priorities that may not be uh, hydromet monitoring observations, that may be other things. Um, so that actually is a, is a challenge even in the United States. Um, in many parts of the U.S., we really don't have those ground observations. And there's this growing um, need to kind of rely on satellite observations to kind of fill in those gaps. So with that said, I think it is absolutely, um, you know, the right thing to do to start with, what are my assets? Like, this is the region that I am interested in. Um, and, it, you know, I guess if I were a um, it, in, in the uh, Ministry of Environment for some nation, I would start with what's already out there, what are the satellite observations, and then I would look at the research and see where is their disagreement, where are these assets that are, let's say, in space, not um, uh, kind of providing me the, the sufficient enough accurate information that I need to make decisions on my groundwater resources, on my surface water resources for my dam operations and so on. Um, and then I would design a monitoring network that is fills those gaps. That's really going to be strategic. And I would say, I mean, the strategy also taking into consideration the fact that absolutely there is this really exciting uh, growing field in Earth observations, especially from the space side, that includes commercial companies. Um, so I, I think that is that is totally the right kind of starting point to say how do we really um, optimize and and fill in the gaps, you know, so that we are knowing that we're going to be limited in what we can actually do on the ground. Um, one other thing I would add is, um, yeah, I think um, Enrique, you mentioned the. Planet as an example of a um, a company that's largely trying to fill in that observation gap and complement those bigger satellites that we have from space agencies, um, which is wonderful. And there are a number of other companies kind of trying to do similar things, maybe with other targeted measurements. Um, but downstream of that, I would also be paying attention to the commercial companies and non-commercial companies that are trying to take that data and kind of pulling in some of the analysis, um, similar kinds of analysis that Yusuf, you know, very nicely highlighted and outlined for us, kind of pulling that in and then providing the outputs for people that need it for decision making so that they actually give you a product that has the information that you need related to, let's say, groundwater resources or other, um, let's say, floods or droughts or, or even agricultural water use optimization. So I think there's this entire kind of ecosystem of Earth observations community that is really growing. Um, and I would also add that for the those in the MENA region, whether they are from research organizations, from the government, from the uh, you know, commercial side, um, should also be contributing, you know, to how we develop these uh, the infrastructure how we how the commercial companies are developing their assets how they're developing their business models because you know when it comes to the government side uh, typically each government maybe has their own process for how they um, set priority observations and priority missions that need to be developed but the commercial sector they're going to be looking at their customers and where is that demand and they're going to be trying to fill that demand so if there is an opportunity if there is demand there are clear communication of gaps and needs uh, from the MENA region, then that, that means that we're going to have, um, you know, the, the 
observation, you know, the different providers, uh, different companies that will be trying to target some of their observation capabilities and their data product capabilities to fit the needs of the region. And I think that's another piece that can be um, really important and part of that strategy. Yusuf, yeah, <laughs> you're already on it. I can, okay. <laughs> I can jump in. No, great, great points. I mean, by Enrique and, and Raha, especially on engaging the private sector. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity there. But I think we're just to answer your question, Mohammed, about the gaps. So I may have touched on this in the presentation, but I think we're generalizing when we say we have a data gap in the MENA region. We have the networks available um, for most part of the of the region. But the gap lies in data sharing, not the data availability. So more work needs to be done, I think, with through the WMO, for example, the World Meteorological Organization, across their regional associations to push for more cooperation uh, with local National Weather Service for data sharing, which is not happening for one reason or another. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, engaging the private sector um, is, is a, is a, is a no-brainer, but we still have a lot to do to bring other nations within the MENA regions up to speed, such as Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. These are all part of the same, um, same area that's gonna be on the forefront of the, of the water security uh, issue with climate change. To, so, you know, organizations such as the Arab League, the Arab League can do a lot to bring, uh, to bring uh, support to these nations to upscale their, their observational capabilities, and get that data fed back to the international community. I mean, this is already happening um, from my experience in the UAE um, between meteorology, the National Center of Meteorology here in the UAE with Yemen, for example, um, other countries in the, in the region, Ethiopia, for example, UAE is supporting them, but that's one-to-one -one national aid uh, for, in their uh, meteorological observation networks. But more can be achieved if we have more a larger umbrella, um, such as the Arab League, uh, overseeing that that strategy and putting it more into effect with a more of a long term uh, roadmap and to getting these uh, countries up to speed. Um, I mean, Saudi, UAE, they're already ahead of the ball game um, with uh, with the private sectors. We're seeing CubeSats, as Enrique mentioned, a drone technology in the UAE is, is also being integrated into operational uh, weather monitoring. So just it's it's really bringing uh, the other countries uh, that are key players in the, in the area here uh, up to speed with us. And William, I was going to say, Yosef, if I, I was going to jump in on that because um, you know you mentioned data sharing, and that's actually one big capacity. This is one big data gap, um, and and that can be expanded to any any country, uh, whether that be uh, those in the Middle East to those in Europe, to even the United States and the Americas. There's, 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 there, there's a lot of issues with data sharing, particularly on some of these uh, higher resolution sensors. Uh, you know, there was, there was a question on floods. Uh, you know, synthetic aperture radar uh, is, is utilized, has been utilized for flood detection, for high resolution flood detection uh, quite a bit. However, um, as can be seen, doesn't matter which country you're in, uh, there are certain areas that the governments don't want you to utilize synthetic aperture radar, uh, and they do some of them do restrict the data that you provide. The other thing um, is not just you know the interaction and uh, interaction between the the the, the, uh, the national meteorological and hydrological center. Uh, centers, uh, NMHS services, sorry. <laughs> Got too many alphabet soups here. Um, anyway, there, there, there is that, um, uh, th that that needs to be done, but there's also uh, an issue in terms of capacity building. You have all these satellites, all these products. If a user or an agency doesn't know how to use the product or, you know, then that's then they're just not going to be able they're just not going to use it um and, and so training um is is one 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 issue um and just to sort of build on capacity building you know there's on the flood side i know it's not necessarily which is part of you know water management um there are groups under uh, uh 
uh, some of these umbrella urine agencies uh, that are starting to try to build these capacity building projects. Uh, EOTech DevNet, don't, I have to look up the acronym, I apologize, <laughs> but um, it's under, uh, you know, basically the idea there is to build out capacity building amongst the various regions. One of the region, and they break it, they break the world up into regions. And one of the regions happens to be Africa, which includes the Middle East. Um, and then they have various uh, two main focus groups, including the flood and drought, which two sides of the same coin, but again, very important to water building, uh, or, or, you know, water uh, usage. Uh, but again, there it's there their use their take the idea is to build the capacity amongst the the various countries there. Uh, to try to help facilitate that information sharing. Um, so I think, you know, but again, capacity building uh, and training is, is, is key no matter what product you're looking at, uh, as well as data sharing. That's one, uh, those are two big, two big gaps that, uh, that, that have to be addressed uh, no matter how much data or how many networks you have. That's great. Thank you guys for that, for those responses. I want to transition to um, the purpose, right? Um, and this part of my questions has kind of come up actually in the in the audience Q and A. And I appreciate our panelists to responding uh, to some of those directly. You're a very self enterprising panel. I, I could almost log off, and and you guys can carry this thing through by yourselves. Uh, but my question on purpose is, you know, we're not necessarily just tracking data or recording data for for records sake. I mean, uh, sure, that's exciting for us in, in a certain regard, but I think it's the purpose and use of the data. And certainly from just the water resources management aspect, that's important. But I, I want to link it to a, a larger issue affecting the region as well, which is uh, relating to climate change and how climate change is connected to the region and how it's affecting those water resources. So the region itself is in the midst of heavy engagement when it comes to uh, sort of boosting its climate resilience, as well as trying to mainstream uh, climate policy that addresses the region's climate vulnerability into its governance. We've, you know, we had, for example, COP27 uh, last year in Egypt, COP28 later this year, later this year in the UAE. So with that in mind, um, and, and this theme, like I said, popped up in a couple of questions I saw is, what are some ways that this type of data information, how can we tangibly use that? And you've, I think you've all answered this indirectly, but I'd like you to just kind of really hit it on the head, which is how can this type of data information be used to support the integration of both water resources management and climate change adaptation bring those two pieces together into the national and regional policies and plans uh, for the region. So how can these nations, uh, whether through through government or, or managing entities, use this information to better enhance both their water resource management and their climate change adaptation? And Raha, maybe I'll, I'll ping you first on that one. Sure. Um, well, First, maybe the scientific answer. I, I think that the, the space-based data just provide us two really important um, things that are important for, for kind of climate change understanding trends. Um, one is the global coverage, largely not not all of them, but many of them provide global coverage. And, and the other is the, uh, the, the kind of record of um, of observations that we can have relatively consistently from uh, from many of these observations. So I think that is really key to us understanding uh, climate change and uh, you know the kind of understanding where trends are. Now, a lot of my work has really been on the adaptation side of things. So I'll speak to that, but I can also mention a couple of things about mitigation. Um, so on the adaptation piece, I think, yeah, there were some questions about disasters and um, the, from the audience um, and, uh, and about agricultural water use as well. So like, I, I think that they, there are a lot of practical things that we can really gain from, from utilizing satellite data for the adaptation piece, for understanding how to better plan 
uh, around, you know, known disaster, high risk disaster areas, you know, areas that are known to, uh, to flood more and more frequently, um, having kind of practical things again, like being able to map out where your um, natural disaster risk areas are, the um, data that we get from satellites are really key to helping us do that in validation with what we have on the ground and, and our models. Um, so I think in that sense, and actually one other thing that hasn't really been touched on directly is the um, when it comes to adaptation and implementation of nature-based solutions, that is a growing area. I think there's um, you know been more more interest kind of around the world to not just think about the traditional gray infrastructure and how we manage our water resources and man manage risk, but also integrating nature-based solutions like you know protecting our wetland areas. Um, our uh, forests and uh, and using that to provide resilience and you know for, for example coastal resilience and also buffers around um, areas that are known to for example flood um, and that's that's another piece that we can really get a lot of helpful information on the um, the kind of state of our for example wetland resources and our forest resources from space that is really hard to get on the ground and so we can kind of get at not just understanding are these areas there? Were they there in the past? Are they going to be in the future? I guess you can see, yes, no, they, they are there. They were there before. Uh, but you can also actually look at the condition, the health of these ecosystems, which is just a, pretty amazing. And again, like we'll need to complement that with information from the ground. But I think that's a really important tool for a lot of governments as they're looking at adaptation to climate change. Um, and then the, uh, and actually maybe just one quick example is um, the flooding in Pakistan that was just so devastating that it, you know it's going to take a very long time to recover from. One of the um, one of the contributing factors that has been you know stated um, both now and in the past when we had floods in 2010 um, is the the um, deforestation. And so that link between our land cover and ex you know extremes like floods. That sort of thing is um, really uh, ripe for satellite data to help us uh, monitor over time and track over time. Um, okay, so on the adaptation piece, and then really quickly on the uh, mitigation, which is just mitigating the emissions. Um, there's really interesting kind of collaborative work across the community being done on methane emissions monitoring. And so we have observations that are coming out of um, uh, uh, satellites from government agencies that have um, kind of been used in creative ways to look at the um, methane emissions, but there are also new satellites coming out. Actually, one of them that's very interesting is uh, coming out of a, an NGO, a non-government organization that uh, called Environmental Defense Fund that um, decided that they wanted to build and launch their own satellite to specifically track methane emissions over known sources. So they created an LLC, they found partners, uh, both in government, you know, in uh, external, not, not the US government, but in other governments, um, philanthropic funding, and, uh, and also, you know, partners in, in industry in the um, private sector. Um, and they will be launching the satellite. So I think that's another piece where we can really look at um, the mitigation piece and target observations to help us manage those much better. William, if if I could pull on one of the threads Raha talked about, same question, but on the disaster response side, which I think is is actually an important part for adaptation, especially for a region that's going to see and is seeing a lot of uh, disaster. And this is an area that you've worked on in terms of disaster emergency response uh, with respect to uh, this type of information and data. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, as uh, Rob was mentioning, you know, having having these satellites to be able to monitor to monitor an unfolding disaster. I mean, the Pakistan flooding is a, is uh, a, a good case of showing how you know it was so large that you know something you know ground bay you know. A lot of people think flooding, and especially the U.S., they look at, oh, we got a rain gauge, we got a flood gauge, we can do that. But when something becomes so large, and even in the United States, when it becomes so large that those th those those river gauges systems aren't, aren't really good at effectively telling you what you know it can take. Yeah, 
your this level and height, right? But it doesn't say how much overland water that you're getting. And so, and of course, if you're on the ground, you're not going to be. You're, you're more you're more interested in leaving than you are to, to monitor the flood. Uh, but you know, again, satellites are very key to do that to 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 monitoring the you know the flood extent, and that actually goes into it's not just for the government itself, but it's also for um, you know agencies like the World Food Program, Red Cross, other agencies to be able to bring in the aid, know when to you know it, it you know how to deliver the aid. I mean, one thing I learned when, when with the World Food Program is if a road is just dirt road is just slightly wet, they can't take their truck over, and you know they have to. They have to fly the plane. You have to fly the aid, and so it's just more expensive. So that's that goes into decision making, not just for a government. They may need to respond, but also for a, you know, an aid agency to be able to go and to respond. But what you can do then is, is, is and, was, and others were mentioning, you know, you you have now you can now go and make a time series, and Noah's actually done this, gone back from 2020 back to 2012 using the VIRS satellites to make an archive of every day, what's the flood condition. And then you can see how many days uh, an area is flooded. And that then can then play into flood mitigation measures. Your, this area always floods, it has a lot of flooding. You can start mitigating the, the, the flood, the, you know, mitigating, you know, cities and, and, and communities along that region. Um, and then that can be expanded back, you know, potentially even further using MODIS. So now you got a 30 year record, 30 plus year record of data uh, going back. So now you have, and that's just floods. Um, you can do that with, you know, your, in, your vegetation index indices, your vegetation stresses, things like that to get an idea of what's, what, what are the trends, what areas are declining in vegetative health, what areas are increasing. Um, and, you know, that can also go into the deforestation uh, and things like that. Um, and, you know, I could just I could go off onto fires, too. But, you know, that's a, that, 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 that actually it is related because you have an idea. You want an idea of where the fires are located because that's where you're going to have these burn scars, which are then are not just input sources to, uh, you know, your greenhouse gases, but those are areas that also are more flood prone um, to uh, to the communities around them. So as we've seen not here in the United States and California, but also elsewhere um, in the world as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> similar, the wildfire issue is yeah. relevant uh, around the Mediterranean region. Uh, yeah, and then you actually do get wildfires. Uh, there were some, I think it was Syria or Lebanon a few years back, there were some very fairly major wildfires in that region as well. Again, that's also potentially an indication of also a drought in that region as well, uh, you know, causing, you know, the fuel to be more, you know, more dry, a more fire, so. Yeah, yeah. Enrique, um, the same question, but I feel like it, it'll start to bleed over to the follow-up question I'll have, which is, you've done work also in this area. Uh, uh, I know for a fact, <laughs> because I was uh, involved with it at some point, but on this connection of using satellite data for uh, both water resources management and uh, truly for, uh, and climate adaptation. Yeah, thanks. Um, this was touched upon earlier in the great presentation we all heard. There's, there's going to be a point where a model, a forecasting system, is the object that allows us to do short or long-term predictions. Short-term predictions are things like, you have a large storm event coming into Saudi Arabia in the form of a hurricane, and it leads to flooding, right? That's short-term prediction of a flood event. Long-term prediction, you're trying to understand the impact of rising temperatures on the water demands of the atmosphere, to your land surface over this huge area. So the climate change signal, primarily through the warming effect, which is more predictable than the precipitation change at this point. So how do you go about doing this? It's not an easy enterprise. 
first, th there is a, a need for a model. Now, luckily, there are several models, and I'm not going to advocate for one model or the other. There are several modeling systems that exist. And these modeling systems have long histories of mathematicians working on them and geoscientists working on them and engineers working on them and software developers working on them. So they are objects. They run on large computing systems in national centers or in research labs. A good example is NASA. NASA builds what are called land information systems. A land information system is a model. It has a mathematical formulation. It's doing the land atmosphere interactions that Yusuf described. It's using remote sensing data to initialize the system, or it's using the most recent remote sensing data to adjust the model in some way. We call that data assimilation, to do data assimilation. Lo and behold, NASA has already built a land information system for the MENA region. It's available and it's published. And it covers all the countries for the most part that we're speaking about today. These types of systems can do short or long-term studies, forecasts. So things like future droughts under a warming signal, right? The implications of drought on famine or food insecurity. Um, what about a long-term period of above average rainfall, the flooding implications of, of a climate change signal. So we've done this in the US, in the Southwestern US, where we take a model, a forecasting system, we improve it using space data, remote sensing data, and then the real work begins. <laughs> that 40 years of effort plus your three-year project is only to set you up for the real work. And the real work is engaging with these water management agencies, engaging with the climate services of a country or a region or a municipality to have them understand and contribute to the discussion, the scientific interaction between the stakeholder who makes decisions and the scientists who can provide a tool to help make decisions so that these tools are localized. The NASA system for the MENA region is an object that hasn't been localized to the context of Egypt or to the context that's probably very different in Yemen. Bringing those tools to the stakeholders is what climate adaptation is all about. And I'll leave it there to allow my uh, colleagues to continue the discussion. Wonderful. Yusuf, I'd argue, the work you're doing is sort of the answer to this question, right? I mean, UAE is in the forefront of this issue right now. It's coming to a head, certainly leading the COP conversation this year and just all the various efforts that are happening in the country. But uh, what, what are your sort of your thoughts on that? No, I mean, Raha, Enrique, uh, William, they all mentioned, I mean, most of the areas where remote sensing is applicable to both adaptation and mitigation uh, policy making. Um, I just, maybe just a small, my two cents is on the, uh, nobody seemed to mention precision agriculture. So the water, food, energy nexus, and that's an important um, aspect that remote sensing of course uh, plays into. So, so we've seen a lot of case studies in developing countries where just uh, you know farmers are, are equipped with now mobile applications to conserve water use and basically optimize their harvest yield. Uh, so that's one, one also, um, you know, boots on the ground solution for, uh, for in terms of adaptation uh, efforts for using uh, remote sensing technology. Great. Um, okay, let's move on to another topic. Um, and this may or may not be our last question because we're, we're, we're at our last uh, quarter hour of our, of our event. So I may combine it with another question I had in mind, which is, and, and you've, again, your responses all touch on, touched on this previously, but but again, maybe to, to dive in a little bit deeper and more with more uh, specificity, which is all of you I know have worked on uh, issues related to uh, utilization of, of remote sensing and so forth in terms of enhancing water resources management. So, the question is, if we look 
outwards uh, beyond the MENA region. Uh, because I think there's a there's a huge opportunity for the MENA region to not have to recreate the wheel in some of these areas where maybe it, there's more work that can be done or there's more advancements that are forthcoming. Uh, and so learning and looking from other parts of the world regarding some of these issues we already talked about today, what are some examples, and, and some of you mentioned a couple uh, previously, but what are some examples of applications outside the MENA region that could serve as sort of a good example, good template uh, for, for folks in the region to look at, to maybe incorporate parts of it that could be useful uh, for the benefit of the MENA region to really move this issue forward and resolve some of these challenges that we talked about. Um, any of you can really start because uh, I, think, I think all of you can address this question uh, based on your previous experiences. Maybe, William, I know you've done a lot of international work. Well, I was going to say, I think the, the, easiest, the, the easiest example is to say, potentially even the Southwest United States, you know, it's a desert arid region where you have to do, you know, they um, in, originally being from California and growing up during, well, it now seems like a minor drought, but compared to currently, you know, cur the, current, the current drought in the Southwest, you know, there's a lot that I think could be learned um, uh, from that region. I think conversely, there's there's a lot to be learned, you know, from you know from Mid East in in the south, you know, the southeast United States because they're both de desert and arid regions. Um, you know, I think there's 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 a lot that can be learned between the two regions. Um, it's you know you can apply, uh, you know, thing you know satellite derived soil moisture you know uh you know uh, uh capabilities and 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 products and the like you can see how it's being used worldwide doesn't matter the, the the country i don't think that just just you can just see how it's being utilized um you know in terms of uh you know measure you know seeing where where you're getting this the, the stresses in the in, in the in the uh, crop growing regions things like that um and you know, I think you know, like I said, this capacity building, uh, capacity building groups, you know, are uh, are really a good way for that sort of collaboration, learning from various countries, even within the Africa, Mid East region. You know, there's a lot of there can be a lot of interaction there, um, uh, in terms of that. Uh, you know, I think one one thing it could potentially, and I know there was a question, uh, a question that was you know sort of hinting at this of you know not just using, using satellites but using uas tech you know unmanned un, unmanned aerial or uh other types of survey unmanned systems uh for you know drone systems uh to do monitoring where to fill in some of the gaps that satellites have or and they're sometimes they're relatively cheap compared to a satellite um you know so i think there's a lot that can be learned between you know between the countries, uh, the biggest, I think, hurdle in that, of course, is politics, unfortunately. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot, a lot of in the scientific community, there's a lot of good collaboration, a lot of interaction between groups and groups like the WMO and others, um, international organizations can be util can work with the agencies uh, to, to sort of build those sort of capacity uh, gaps. And I think uh, one, one other thing to mention is you mentioned, uh, you know, COP27 and, and 28, you know, things like the Cairo Water Week last, uh, last year uh, it was a good, it, you know, collaboration between, you know, there's a lot of participation from the, the MENA region uh, in that conference, uh, I actually happened to participate, uh, uh, present at that conference talking about uses of satellite products. Uh, and there was a lot of interest in utilizing those satellite products. Um, uh, in fact, there's one, uh, the Nile River Basin, uh, you know, they're wanting to start to try to utilize satellite products uh, in, in their monitoring. We're still building up that interaction there. But, you know, I think the thing is there's that, there's that interest in trying to utilize remote sensing, whether it's from satellites or from even UASs, but also including the, 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 the other key part is the, the ground measurements and modeling as well. 
Yeah. I'd like to make a point uh, to follow up on, on this comparison that Williams brought to bear between drylands, global drylands. It's not only the Middle East and the Southwestern US, there's drylands in Asia, there's drylands in Australia, there's drylands in Africa. These are the best places for remote sensing data acquisition and processing. Cloud cover, low. You can see the surface, 300, 350 days of a year, okay? That's one. Two, the, the difference in what you see between what's desert or dry and the human impact or footprint, whether it's city or town or agricultural area or flooded zone is huge. So taking advantage of the fact that we're surrounded by dry landscapes means that we could see our target a lot easier. We don't have tree cover to get in the messy way. So we could actually see the soil. So soil surface retrieval from space borne platforms is a lot easier in dry lands. So at least in my view, there needs to be a coordination of those of us that live in dry lands, MENA, the Southwestern US, elsewhere, because these are the places that you could do a lot of innovations with space-based technologies. Great. Raha, do you have any, any thoughts you wanna share on this? Yeah, a few thoughts. Um, so, you know, and, and it's great that we have a couple of participants that work in the Southwest of the US. I mean, one thing in terms of the um, data sharing, um, that is a challenge. That's a challenge in, in many parts of the world, actually really everywhere. Um, so in the United States, we have two different um, kind of uh, agreements with the two bordering countries. Um, one in Canada in the north and then with Mexico in the south for data sharing. And there are kind of, you know, agencies on either side that have the mandate to um, to work on this collaborative data sharing initiatives. Um, it's a little bit easier in the north <clears throat> than, than it is in the south, but I think maybe one one thing that could be looked at is um, just different models for, for data sharing and collaboration across borders that have been successful. Um, <clears throat> what's worked well, what hasn't? Because I, I think that, yeah, I agree with the point that Yusuf brought up. That is that is a really ch big challenge. A lot of my work previously was in Latin America, a lot in the Caribbean. Um, and uh, and even in the Caribbean, you have islands that, um, you know, I worked in Haiti and, and the Dominican Republic. It was very challenging to have data sharing across those two uh, countries. And so a lot of times you had really key data uh, for <clears throat> things like assessing flood risk that were just sitting on, uh, you know, paper copies on someone's desk that was not necessarily kind of fed up. And that's not going to be the challenge every place, but um, that's just to say, I think there that that's one key area I would say um, could there could be some co-learning done of uh, what could work, and um, and then the other I would say is on the um, there's a lot of growth in the space sector in the region. And there's a lot of growth in kind of the, the research, not just, just um, you know, national space programs, but also research organizations that are tied to the national um, space programs. I think that maybe, um, you know, and, and there is um, a lot of growth in the MENA region, but there's also a lot of growth in other areas too, like in Australia, really ramping up their um, space interests and, and efforts, particularly around Earth observations, um, and and also in uh, uh, the South America as well. So I think that maybe looking at how other other agencies, other countries are kind of developing their um, uh, research and space programs. Um, again, what's kind of worked well, what hasn't. There are in the U.S. right. That's one of the, that's kind of the most established. Um, uh, space programs that we have with NASA uh, being the federal space agency, <clears throat> the national federal space agency. Uh, but now we have this, uh, like it was alluded to, uh, this growing commercial um, sector. We have uh, established kind of private sector industry that's been working with NASA um, as, you know, contracting on these really big missions to co-develop them. Um, and, and then there are all the research organizations, academic institutions. I mean, frankly, we haven't figured out how all those different entities are gonna are working together. That that's an open area, um, and I, I think that's a 
that's a really big part as you're talking about. And I think there was a question in the chat of are these, um, you know, with the, the CubeSats, with the small constellations that are coming out of <clears throat> a lot of the commercial companies, are the larger missions of like the likes of NASA or ESA or JAXA going to become obsolete? And I mean, I'll answer to that is, is no, because they have very different purposes. The, you know, the, the space agencies are providing missions for science purposes. I mean, NASA's mandate is to do science. It's not to provide operational data products for farming operations or for, you know, wildfire. They are doing that. They're a key part of that. Um, but that needs to be done through collaboration with partners and, you know, uh, kind of across the board. Um, but there are a lot of outstanding questions around that. So I would say, I think there's... Um, a really great opportunity for a lot of the countries that are thinking about ramping up, you know, they're, they're both kind of on the observation side and on the uptake of the, the satellite data, they're thinking about like, how are we going to grow into this area? There's a lot of opportunity to do things differently and do things a little bit more kind of with that integration in mind. If you are really interested in using satellite data for decision-making for X, Y, and Z, um, think about that and build out your kind of research organizations and even your, you know, promote growth in your commercial sector and the private sector to help you fill in those gaps. Because, I mean, on the U.S. side, I'll say that that's something that we're just kind of having to figure out to do because because up until kind of relatively recently, if you look at the time time scales, um, you know, these data were really used for research and for science. They weren't really being used for operational decision making. Um, that, that's something that's new. And we are, you know, still, again, like needing to kind of under, to, to develop the models of how this works well together. So um, in some ways, yes, look at what others are doing in the more established, uh, I guess, programs in more established countries um, with, with use and uptake and providing, but also maybe think about doing things differently because the, you you know you have the, the um, hindsight you know, being 2020 and you have the power of observation um, to, to really develop something that's gonna be very well suited to what the needs are of each country. And I think in that case, Raha, that phrase quite literally uh, hindsight's 2020 when we're talking about observations. Uh, Yusuf, I'll I'll give you the final word as we're uh, almost up on the on the on the half hour mark to end our event. Uh, I guess same question, but maybe slightly inverted. It since you are in the region, you are in the space. Uh, uh, in terms of not just what you can learn, but how can international organizations or governments assist in terms of boosting these efforts within the region itself? Uh, indeed, I mean we covered most of the you know the agencies in the U.S. Uh, and, and efforts there. I mean the better the better example I think that would work uh, in terms of regional or, or national scale collaboration is the UMETSAT, so the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites. Very long. So UMETSAT is basically an intergovernmental organization um, with a current state I think of uh, of thirty uh, European member states. Um, so it's it's an operational satellite agency um, specifically um, mandated for the monitoring of, of weather, climate, and environment from space. So the UAE, Saudi, uh, the, the bigger players in, in the in the region here, they're already uh, launching their own uh, their own uh, satellite mission. So the Khalifa Sat was was launched in October 2018. It was 100% design manufactured in the UAE. Um, and it's it's relaying uh, valuable satellite imagery uh, to the international community. Not so much dedicated to Earth observation, but I think in the near in the near future, I would say in the next decade, more Arab countries are already uh, very vocal about uh, joining the space race. Um, very ambitious plans here in the region. Um, so this might lay the foundation for uh, you know a Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, you know, so wide space program. With a mandate similar to UMETSAT, you know, having dedicated um, Earth observation missions as part of its uh, strategic pillars, for example. Fantastic. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, and I think uh, did a good job translating the technical to uh, to sort of policy uh, type of discussion. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you for our audience for tuning in. What a wonderful panel! Really enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, I could have tuned out and you guys could have carried this through perfectly. So I really appreciate your expertise and insight. Um, and with that,
uh, we will conclude our panel. Thanks again.